Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. This is Lauren Richmond Jr., and today I'm welcoming Sean Bublitz to the show. Sean has spent time over the past two decades at Community Christian Church in Naperville, Illinois, and Granger Community Church in Granger, Indiana, serving in weekend service, arts, and senior leadership roles. For the past five years, he has served as a ministry consultant and on the leadership team at the Unstuck Group. Sean lives with his wife and five kids in the South Bend, Indiana area. All right, welcome to the show, Sean Bublitz. Thanks for being here. What else would you like our listeners to know about you? Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Uh, well, I think you said in my bio, uh, I have five kids. So um, the biggest thing, I guess the greatest thing to know about me is that I'm busy. <laughs> Yeah. Five kids keeps you running um pretty much constantly. But um it's great. I love it. I love it. Um the other thing is I I think that I have a, a pretty interesting role really in the um I guess I would say big C church and the church in, in North America primarily. I spend, you know, most of my time talking with pastors who are considering partnering with the unstuck group and really just hearing their headline challenges, um, what's going on in their church. And I think that gives me just a really interesting pulse on the trends in the church across North America. Um, I get to hear, you know, uh, things that are happening in smaller churches, medium-sized churches, larger churches, and um, following those trends over time, and especially through the pandemic, has been really interesting. So um, I don't know, you know, how many other people get to have those types of conversations. I mean, I'm talking to 350, 400 pastors over the course of the year from all over, again, North America. So just an interesting role uh, to get to play. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Share, if you would, kind of about your faith journey, what that what that looked like initially and what that looks like today. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in a Christian home, and uh, my mom was the one who kind of drug me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, right? We didn't miss. And um there's a lot of good that came out of that. But uh, for me personally, I found um, that there was a point really where my mom's faith needed to become my own faith. And uh, I had a struggle with that through some of my teenage years. Of course, that's when a lot of that um, kind of hits. And so um, there were there was a significant kind of life event uh, that happened to me when I was 13. And it caused me to really question a lot of things. And um, it caused me to really kind of begin a search for what I, what I thought. And, um, I had a really key relationship in my life at the time, um, through my youth pastor, uh, somebody who I was close to and, uh, was close to me and was patient with me as a young, probably super naive teenager. Uh, I can't even imagine what I was like back then, (laughs) but I appreciate his pace, patience and his, um, you know, building into me and speaking into me and answering questions and letting me process because that's really, I think, where my own, my personal faith was formed. Um, and then, you know, that has influenced my life, uh, even to today and now my kids' lives as well. So I think, you know, it's the, that particular event in my life, the relationships that I had around me, and then just my openness to exploring, you know, yeah. um, what did I really believe? What did I really think? And what had been my experience that um, kind of brought my faith journey full circle? So, um, yeah, that's a bit about my story. It's um, I'm 41 now, and I feel like I continue to learn. I just love learning, and you know, um, anywhere that I can grow, anybody that I can learn from, I'm just very curious and eager to do that. So, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. What's like a spiritual practice, spiritual discipline that's meaningful for you? Yeah. Well, I mentioned that I have five kids. And um, so this is um, this is one that I'm continuing to develop, but I'm just constantly working on pause, on trying to pause and have a unprogrammed time. Um, you know, with five kids, full-time job, uh, I volunteer here locally in a couple of areas. Um, 
you know, have a house to take care of, which seems to take up a lot more time than I want it to. It just feels like, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate with this. It feels like you're constantly overprogrammed. And it, I think it's really hard to hear from God if you never stop, if you're just constantly going and in that busyness. And so I, I or personally, I've come to believe it's really a spiritual practice just to pause and have some unprogrammed time where you can hear from God and um, you just can have that downtime that I think is very sacred. So that's a developing for me. I'm not awesome at it. I continue to try to get better at it and I have to force myself to do it, but, um, uh, but I'm working on it. Yeah, that's helpful. Helpful for me, at least. I mean, I only have two kids, but it still feels quite busy at times. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, Sean came on today to talk about an exciting topic of church <laughs> governance. Uh, I'm a nerd. I'm a church nerd. So I, I think these things matter. Um, yeah. He he worked with the Unstuck Group. So maybe before we get started into the, the lively topic of church governance, talk about <laughs> the Unstuck Group who you are, what you're about, those sort of things. Yeah, people see that that church governance topic, and I know it's thrilling. Um, but yeah, the Unstuck Group, so we've uh, we've been around a little more than 13 years. Uh, the Unstuck Group really started out of uh, our founder, Tony Morgan, his writing. Um, Tony was a pastor in local church, and uh, he started writing. He, I think he's a good writer. I think he's pretty talented at it. He uh, wrote some books. He was blogging back when blogging was cool. Um he even had a podcast back in the very early days. I wish we could find some of those episodes because that'd be entertaining. But uh, through some of that uh, writing that he was doing, there were other churches that started to reach out and just say, um, hey, we're going through some of the same things that your church has been through or you know, you're kind of down the road on. Would you help us with that? And uh, over time, that morphed into you know Tony helping more and more churches. And along the way, Tony kind of recognized that there were a lot of churches who would reach out and just proactively say, you know, we just feel stuck. We don't know how to diagnose it. We don't know exactly what's wrong, but we just feel stuck and like we can't get past it. And that's really where the name The Unstuck Group came from. It was the self-assessment of those pastors who would reach out to us. And so now we're about 13 years in. Um, we've we've worked with uh, around 600 churches across North America mainly, but in, in some other countries around the world. We've uh, really recognized these kind of common issues that stand out, um, no matter the church uh, size, denomination, background. That's been even more true through the pandemic. It's been amazing how the pandemic has caused churches to all sort of face the same different types of challenges. Um Certainly, the scope is different depending on the size um, and the context they're doing ministry in, but the challenges are all still very similar. And so uh, we help churches just get clarity around where is it that God's calling us to go? What's God calling us to accomplish together? And uniting their church, aligning their team around that, um, that vision that God has for them. And then just as importantly, what's the plan to get it accomplished? Because um, we've seen many times it's a bit easier for churches to just say, this is the vision for our church. And then that becomes kind of the vision for tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes <laughs> because nothing about today, yeah. the urgency about today doesn't change. And so we also want to help churches with that. We help churches identify what's the plan, what needs to change today in order for us to get to where we believe God's calling us to go tomorrow. So so that's what we do. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty thrilling uh, exciting thing to get to do to partner with churches is certainly there are some hard times, but man, to work with pastors and other leaders who begin to see the fruit and feel that freedom and momentum on the other side is, um, it's just awesome. So it's a, it's a great role that we get to play. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate what you said about churches having common issues, no matter the size. Yeah. I remember several years ago, I was on vacation with, with our, with my family and like, sitting in some like, I think we we're somewhere in Colorado, some like hot springs or something and got chatting with this guy. And he's like, Oh, I'm a pastor in Greeley. I don't remember the church, but it's a pretty big, pretty good sized church. And he's like, yeah, you know, here I was pastoring a very small kind of edge of town type church. And he's like, Hey, we have same, same issues. And obviously mm -hmm. back then I was, didn't quite believe it, but I think, <laughs> I think it's true. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And and now more true than ever because of the pandemic. Um, I, honestly, and, and we're going to dive into this a little bit, but 
the number one topic that pastors and church leaders have reached out to us about over the last couple of years has been organizational structure and staffing. That has been the primary thing. Now, there's certain other, certainly other things going on, but even for the from the largest churches down to the smallest churches, it's been those issues primarily. And you know, we're experiencing a lot of that culturally with the Great Resignation, a lot of transition happening, some of those other things. But then there are some even some other things that the pandemic has kind of brought out about about how churches are structured that have become pain points. And so there's been a lot of conversation and a lot of looking for direction at what the right thing to do, the right next thing to do is there. So, um, yeah, again, very interesting because no matter the size, denomination, background, context they're doing ministry in, all those issues are very similar. Yeah. So I, I've been listening to, I don't, again, I don't know how I came across the Unstuck podcast, been listening it to at least two, three years. And because again, I'm a church nerd and <laughs> I think y'all have done this again, previously in the past, but just recently you did a, a series on church governance. And I was like, man, I really appreciate this topic because I've seen mm. bad church governance, just, yeah, just kneecap churches to use a word. Um, right. So talk a little bit about church governance, what it is, some different examples and why it matters. Yeah. Yeah, so I you know, I think church governance really is just the way that uh, a church is organized to fulfill its mission, um to care for its people and then to also to manage its resources. And you know, the most typical way we see this play out in churches is uh, they have a group of elders or a board or a council kind of that governs the church. Uh, that group oversees the the senior pastor and sometimes in churches some additional staff as well. Um in some churches, there are additional boards and committees that then oversee various aspects of ministry around the church. And um, of course, it it varies depending on the denomination um, that they're affiliated with or if the church is unaffiliated. Um, but, you know, governance, I, I think it's, it's really important because, first of all, the governing body of the church should be responsible for keeping the church on mission and, to, and for making adjustments if the mission isn't being accomplished. And that has to, I think, start first and foremost in churches with agreeing on what the mission is, um, which, you know, honestly, most churches do. Uh, when we work with a church, we spend very little time on the mission statement because what we found is that primarily churches aren't confused on what the mission is. We go back to the Great Commission, right, and say, go into all the world, make disciples. Uh, we may reword that differently, but if a church is if a church is working on a mission statement, I mean, we'd encourage them, don't spend a lot of time, a significant amount of time, wordsmithing, rewordsmithing the Great Commission, right? We know what the mission is. Let's spend more time in some other areas. But um, churches really need to then also agree on how they're defining success as a ministry. Yeah. What does success look like for us as a church? How do we know if we're succeeding in our mission? And if those ministry goals aren't being accomplished... Um, then we need to make some course correction and get things back on track, however that you know might look in, the, in any particular church. So um, you know it's it's kind of difficult to boil it down to a right way and wrong way, but we've collected enough data uh, over the number of years from churches to see some trends as to like what types of governance can get churches stuck and keep them from accomplishing the mission. So, um, here here are just a few kind of common mistakes that we see churches make that lead to getting stuck. Um, first of all, church leaders are elected based on po popularity, popular votes. I don't know if you've noticed, but elections seem to create division, <laughs> <laughs> right? Culturally. Yeah. I mean, we've yeah. experienced that certainly the last, you know, four, eight years, elections create division. And, uh, that's a mistake that oftentimes churches make within their, how they're forming governance. Um, Another mistake is that the whole church is given a, a voice in decision making, and if everyone in the church expects to have a voice and a vote, there ne there never really will be unity within the church. And when everyone has a voice, you're you're giving potentially non believers or spiritually immature believers equal say in the spiritual direction of the church. And um, you know, I we just have never not seen that end well. Um, another mistake that we see is that there are multiple boards and committees and sometimes subcommittees overseeing the church. 
Um, you know, we had one church that we worked with th- had 34 different committees in their church. And every different committee in the church begins to feel like they have some control. And what that leads to really is a lack of unity and alignment in decision making. And even simple decisions become challenging decisions. Um, and they take sometimes an inordinate amount of time. I had one church that I was working with, a UMC church, a dear pastor there. He spent, uh, I can't, I, I want to say it was like six to eight months waiting for a committee to make a decision over whether they could move a piano out of a certain room in their <laughs> building. I'm laughing because I know it's true. I know it happens. <laughs> I know. And it, the poor guy it was so frustrating for him because, of course, there are more, much more important things to be working on and that he wanted to be focused on, but he had spent so much time trying to get a committee to make a decision on moving a piano. So just, just, you know, one, one example, maybe an extreme example, but one example. Um, And then the other mistake I'd say is that the board oversees multiple staff members. And we see this play out in churches sometimes Um, situations where staff are led or cared for by a team of board members, or, you know, each board member is assigned to lead and care for, different staff or, or, or people, in either of those cases, it really becomes almost impossible to create unity and alignment among the staff themselves. You end up with different leadership direction, development, different development priorities, different clarity around the wins, and really just kind of uh, different and distinctive approaches to performance management and cultural alignment. So, so those are those, some mistakes that we see. Now, of course, the question is like, well, what's the better way of doing right. that? And so for us, you know, what we've seen again in the data and both in anecdotally as well in healthy churches is that rather than voting on board members based on popularity, you know, leaders really should just be appointed based on their gifting and the biblical qualifications in alignment with the church's mission and vision and doctrine. And um, how we see that play out in healthy churches is, um, you know, the lead pastor, the senior pastor, other senior level staff, and and sometimes the current board members would recommend new board members. Um, These are the people that are leading the day-to-day of the church. And so they have a clarity around what does it take to lead at this level in the church. Um, They do a thorough screening then. Um, You know, spiritual leadership has to be based on biblical qualifications. So we need to thoroughly screen any new people who would be coming on to our board. Um, And then the board would affirm these people. Board would say, yes, they they are qualified. Um, Sometimes, you know, depending on the church and the denomination, and there's a congregational vote that's uh, required. Um, And what we encourage churches to do is just to vote on affirming only. You know, avoid having candidates running against each other to represent or be the voice of a certain segment of your church. Again, the goal of all of this is to create unity within the church. And some of these things that we do actually creates division because anytime you vote, you know, you're going to have winners or losers right. and that just fosters division in the church. And um, related to that, healthy churches really follow through with the rotations of their leaders too. Mm-hmm. Um, that they're probably already have established in their bylaws. If not, they may need to look at that again, but um that rotation of leaders forces you to be more intentional about raising up future leaders, which is a really good thing in the church, really important. Um, it creates more opportunities to really expand the diversity of your leadership. Um, there are so many congregations across North America that are that uh, are working towards and need to be more multi-ethnic, more multi-generational. So that gives you that, that opportunity as well. In addition, it just brings a fresh perspective to your team. Um, the, even the best leaders really should rotate off you know, and have at least a year between their terms. So, I mean, really, so to kind of boil that all down for us, the principle is that we've seen healthy, thriving churches be led by a lay leadership team that streamlines decision-making within the church and really empowers the pastor and the staff team to lead strong. Yeah. So I appreciate you sharing all that. So I'm going to kind of break down, you gave a lot of good stuff here and I'm kind of work through it here. The first question I have to ask again and I kind of mentioned this before we started recording is some pushback that I would hear if I would have these kind of conversations is again, I've worked in church contexts that often have a congregational polity Uh, Two denominations I've worked worked in have a congregational polity. Um, The tradition in congregational polity is that kind of, like you said, everyone has a voice and a vote. 
Mm-hmm. Um, everything needs to be voted on. Some some denominations really really emphasize or encourage a consensus model approach. Um, and and again, I'm, I'm not even getting to other denominations like like a Presbyterian model um, with the, with their synods and, and Lutherans have. I might be right. mixing them up here. Um, talk That's okay. About, like talk about if you can. Like I'm sure you've heard some of this pushback before. Like. Is it? I'm not even sure what, which critique to get. I guess because you probably put them all. But <laughs> I mean, how do you respond to some of those critiques around like, hey, this is not congregationalism, or this is this is um, consolidating power into, into too few hands? Sure. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. First and foremost, the goal of all of this is the health of the church and accomplishing the mission. Mm-hmm. And what do we need to do? In order to do, in order to accomplish it, and I think it's always good for us to look back at stri- scripture and start there. Start with the Bible to inform how we're doing this. Um, and you know, we, I mean, we encourage churches. So, um, as they're exploring this together, you know, to really begin to think about um, what are the characteristics of healthy leaders in the church. Um, and and go through scripture together. Go on a journey together and really explore that. What are what are the characteristics of healthy leaders within the church? What's the role that God intended for those leaders? And really, then after you answer those questions, what structure is would best empower qualified leaders to engage in that role? And um, I mean, there's some kind of obvious places to start in scripture. First Timothy three. Uh, Titus 1, 1 Peter 5, you go through there, and there are plenty of other places, but to go through and really go on a journey together through Scripture and ask that question, and what does that structure look like for us to empower leaders within the church who really will help us accomplish our mission and lead to a healthy church? And um, I think that kind of self-exploration uh, that'll begin to help you to answer some of those questions. And you can look at, well, does that structure look similar to what we already have? Is the structure empowering leaders? Is it creating unity within our church? Is it helping us to accomplish our mission and accomplish the, the um, you know, how, how we're defining success as a church together? There is a lot more frustration with the organizational structure than there is health and experience of accomplishing the mission. Yeah. Um, so I think it's always good to go back and start with scripture uh, and begin there. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm going to kind of come heavy with some of these critiques just because for context sake, I've heard the, all these. Um, so again, we're, we're kind of in a time and place. Uh, you mentioned like some of the scandals of the last few years, at least yeah. in the political yeah. field. Certainly we've seen those scandals in the church world. In the church um, in churches, too, right. Again, Big yeah. and small, and a common critique I hear is like, "Hey, um, you know, like, like if we think of a case like a, a, to throw them under the bus, like Will Creek. They had a board who yeah. kind of said, "Hey, everything's fine here with the uh, with Hybels, right, Bill Hybels, you know." Yeah. So how do I think many would say like, "Oh man, like boards, board members appointing new board members that just ripe for abuse and." scandal and pushing things under the rug. So what's, yeah. how do you respond to that critique? Yeah, absolutely. So there are, there are um, mistakes that we see churches make uh, both large and small in smaller churches. Um, sometimes the boards, the structure of the organization committees tend to be too controlling and um, less likely to give up control in order to streamline decision-making, in order to bring more health to the church. But the opposite is true with larger churches. In larger churches, the mistakes that we've made is that we've seen them be um, not be hold their pastors as accountable as they should. Mm-hmm. And accountability is a little bit of a slippery slope. In fact, in the healthiest governance models, what we see is that the role of the board really is encouraging the senior pastor certainly there is an aspect of accountability there and there should be, and that's healthy and that's biblical also. But we too many times miss the opportunity to encourage our senior pastor. And I bet all the senior pastors listening would say, 
I know that feeling yeah. uh, because I, I talk to him on an ongoing basis. And it's, it's that when we lean so hard on accountability and less on encouragement, mm-hmm. um, we miss the relationship. And so we see that mistake in larger churches. Certainly larger churches need to be organized in a way that there are checks and balances, there's encouragement for their pastor, and there's accountability. And I think I think the struggle has been that there have been some very public, very from very large churches, some right. fallout, you know, some things that have ha- gone wrong where there has been poor structure. And we would say just the same for those. That's an unhealthy governance model. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, that's not the intention and, and not the biblical way, not the way uh, things should be done. So there certainly, but that does not mean that it should lead to a knee jerk reaction for all of the other churches where we become too controlling. And because I, you know, I talk to the, these people on a daily basis, there are hundreds, thousands of pastors in North America who are doing it the right way, who are, are a people of character. Mm -hmm. And they're competent at what they do. And we should be empowering them to lead in the local church in the way that they can. Um, But but maybe because we've heard a few stories in the news, we think, well, we don't want that to happen at our church. So we pull back on that a little bit. Yeah. that, That may not be the healthy way either. Yeah. Okay. Another pushback I've heard is a, is that like hierarchy in itself is inherently wrong and every decision should be like a, a consensus based approach. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, I I mean, hierarchy is always there in some form if we're honest about it, right? I've never I've never seen a model where decisions get made with complete unity. Uh eventually someone disagrees, someone gets hurt. And again, if we look back at the biblical model, um we see in scripture time and time again that God had appointed leaders that there were people gifted with leadership abilities. And we know that too, just as well with the, the church. The church is made up as a body. We don't, we're not all gifted in the same way. And that's the intention. That's the way God has designed us. We all play a role and play a different part. God has given some people leadership abilities. He's given others different abilities. And when we embrace that, then we really become the body of Christ. When we fight against that, um, we're fighting against God's intended role. So um, one of the stories we like to look back at is just the the uh, Moses leading the people out of Israel or uh, of Israel out of Egypt, you know, and um, th- Moses is leading these people on a forty year journey through the wilderness. I can't even imagine what that was like to go forty years in the wilderness trying to lead this group of people around. That's a revitalization of ministry, and some might be in line church is going to need forty years. <laughs> yeah, I know that's the way some pastors feel, but. You know, um, they're they're approaching uh, the promised land in in the land of Canaan. You know, and Moses sent out twelve scouts, one person that represented each of the twelve tribes, right? And they explored the land for forty days. And eventually, Joshua, Joshua and Caleb came back and reported, "The land is wonderful. It's awesome. It's it's bountiful country and the, the land flowing with milk and honey." And then ten other scouts came back and they said that they saw giants in the land yeah. and they started to spread the news about how the people in Canaan were strong and were powerful. People of Israel then started complaining and weeping and protesting and crying out about their current leaders, Moses and Aaron. They wanted to replace their leaders. In fact, uh, Numbers 14 says, uh, they said, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. They wanted to vote on a new leader. What if God had let the people just take a vote? Unanimous and, and come up with, let's come up with some consensus here. What if God would have let kind of the majority rule? Uh, the people would have never made it to the promised land, right? So, you know, rather than voting, uh, we what we've seen is healthy churches create systems for appointing people who meet those biblical qualifications of leadership. And then the healthy churches let those people provide spiritual leadership and direction for their ministry. And if you think about it, when we do these kinds of votes, who, who votes in, the, in those instances? Uh, it biblically qualified leaders, for sure, but then also sometimes people who may not be spiritually mature or people who may not be qualified to lead or maybe not even aligned to your mission and your vision. Um, maybe sometimes, and we've seen this in churches before, sometimes we'll take a vote on the weekend and some people may not even be believers. Um, 
So again, you know, if some denominations require this, we, we just say try to vote as little as possible to meet those requirements within your denomination. If you have flexibility, avoid, you know, any kind of congregational votes completely. Uh, the fewer, the better, because those, you know, voting again tends to lead to division within the church. Yeah. I, you know, I'm thinking back to, again, a time that I served in a church that very much had a not healthy consensus model of yeah. voting. And it was like everybody would gather in a room and it was just such a horrifically designed uh, mm. organizational structure because, you know, they had bylaws, but it was kind of like loosely interpreted. And basically they interpreted it like whoever showed up that night was quote unquote, the board. Um, yeah. Just horrific uh, from my opinion, yeah. at least. And even though there was the, the quote unquote consensus model, there was still like, there's still like the power players in the room. And I, yeah. that's why I appreciate what you said about like, uh, I don't remember what word you use, but like within a room, there's always some people who hold significant sway. And yeah, if they, they have more influence, right? right. And if they kind of yeah. like, hmm, you know, depending on their energy, they can really sway the room. And it, yeah. and it's not like this, this just this, um, and this is something interesting y'all talk about. Um, in in kind of your work, and I I think if, if I'm remembering correctly, like you say something about being an American way versus a biblical way, which again is strong words, uh, your words, not mine. But I I thought <laughs> thought similarly, like how much of this goes back to this this kind of like enlightenment, like that we're all kind of uh, unique or maybe not unique, um, all kind of same rational, emotionally stable beings, and that. It's kind of a harsh way to say it. I don't know. But again, kind yeah. of assuming we're all on the same level, on the same plane. And the point you're making is that's not necessarily the case, right? Well, the point is more that God has just gifted us differently. Yeah, yeah. And we see this as we as we do sta- work with staffing in churches, in organizational structure. You know, God has all wired us up to play a different role. And man, if we were all the arm or if we were all the foot, it it would be terrible. Like this wouldn't work, Right. And so God has gifted us all differently. We should not look at the people with leadership giftings as better than anyone else. Mm-hmm. God's just God just gave them a different gift, a different role to play within the church. Think about if we had no one on the team that maybe had the opposite of just a leadership gifting, just a doing right, gifting, right. getting things done. Nothing would ever get done. We'd be in meetings all day, right? And so uh, we need to all play our role. And sit within that role. And I think sometimes, um, you know, one of the, the struggles is churches kind of are challenged with, well, what is what do those leadership giftings look like? Or or what should um, someone in this leadership position be doing? And here are just, I, let me just give you a kind of a few things that we think we see in yeah, these roles. Yeah. It's kind of like a role description for people who would sit in these leadership, um, um, on a leadership board within your church. And this may help you to really think through, well, who are the types of people in my church who would fit these roles? Um, First and foremost, modeling spiritual leadership to the congregation, demonstrating full devotion to Christ. Paul expressed, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And are these people living a life worth following? One of the things that we've noticed within the church, if you want to raise the temperature for leadership within your church— Make sure that people are first and foremost the primary spiritual leaders within your church. That will immediately weed out some people. Some people will self-select out of that, right? But that, I mean, that is one of the primary roles of these people in this leadership position should be modeling spiritual leadership to the congregation. Um, And then, like I mentioned before, providing encouragement and accountability to the senior pastor, um, we are so so much more focused often on accountability and rarely committed to that encouragement and the healthy relationship between the board, the council, the session, whatever you call it in your church, and your senior pastor requires both of those, accountability and encouragement. Um, the other thing is the, this this group needs to really protect the established mission and vision of the church. Um, that doesn't include, we're not including the ministry strategy in that. We actually would recommend that you empower your pastor and your staff with the strategy piece, but what's the mission and the vision of the church that should require input and approval of this board of, um, you know, spiritual leaders within the church. And then, and then also make significant stewardship decisions. 
um, there needs to be this entity that is making these financial decisions for the church um, and, and really big picture decisions, mm-hmm. annual budget, salary of the, the senior pastor, you know, land acquisitions, construction contracts, things like that. Um, the board really should set the overall staffing budget and salary of the lead pastor. And then from there, empower the lead pastor and, and their team um, to determine how they're managing their staff on a day-to-day basis. So, you know, if, if the board is really doing those four things, um, they're going to be functioning very, very well. And if you think about people who would fill those roles well within your church, they're probably the best candidates to sit on this leadership team. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate you really emphasizing the, the spiritual emphasis being like the number one point, because again, absolutely. In many churches, it's like, well, this guy is, he's got a finance background, ready to go or, right. or she's got, right. you know, plenty of experience in nonprofit, whatever. Um, yeah. But if they're not, if they're not like, if they're not committed to the mission, if they're not committed to following the way of Jesus, like it's not going to work uh, because they're going to have different alignment with like, how should we, in you know, how should we invest our dollars type, type yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I just got an email from a, a pastor uh, a couple of days ago and the pastor was asking, should, should I require my board to be tithing? And, uh, you know, my response to that, and I think our response is you're the people who are on your board serving on this leadership team, they should already be practicing those spiritual dis- disciplines. Right. That should be a requirement right. to sit in that leadership position yeah. because again, they're, they're modeling spiritual leadership. So are they in healthy spiritual relationships that are bringing them closer to God? Are they practicing generosity? Are they serving? Um, you know, those just the, all of those different spiritual disciplines, um, are very important. And so people who are already modeling those things, again, if they have the leadership gifting as well, are great candidates for this leadership team. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you've, you've talked about here throughout this conversation that I just want to, again, kind of highlight is within many of the contexts that I've worked in and I hear it from other pastors is this, this idea or expectation that a pastor is essentially like a chaplain, chaplain yeah. of an institution rather than a leader. And and that's why I appreciate you said it. You said it much better than I did around the idea of different people having different spiritual giftings, uh, not making one person better than the other. But yeah. that's where I found myself frustrated working in some context where it's like, Hey, I really believe that God has gifted me to, to do things and to lead in certain ways. And when, you know, it, for me, at least it was frustrating when I'm like, Hey, I feel like, I feel like I'm not being honored to use kind of the yeah. gifts I have. Um, yeah. So l- before we take a break, let me ask this question here. And, and I feel like we could continue this conversation for another 30 minutes. <laughs> um, Probably. What, so, you know, you're talking, again, t- you're talking to pastors, church leaders here. Uh, mm-hmm. Sell, or maybe not sell, but like give some like, give some like first steps to like a pastor or ch- church leader who's like, boy, our, our organizational structure it's really like, it's really unhealthy. I'm really being limited to to live out my gifts and my calling and our mission as a church. Like, change is never well received in a church, yeah. especially these kind of big changes. How can a, yeah. a pastor, or church leader, begin to like move the conversation forward? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I'd start again with scripture, like I mentioned before, and just go back and read through scripture. I would do this with the decision makers within your church. And just consider what is what does spiritual leadership look like through scripture and you know, write down some of those things. And then asking that question, what would we change about our structure to better reflect this and what we're seeing in scripture? Um, the other thing I would do is start to create some urgency around why this might need to change. So in some of the data that we've collected, and we collect data from churches on an ongoing basis, we put out a quarterly report, report called the Unstuck Church Report, where we're constantly analyzing the data just to see what are some of the numbers telling us about trends in the church? That's just one measurement, of course. But um, things that we've noticed, stuck churches, churches that are declining in health have larger boards. In fact, they're 40% larger than churches that are increasing in health. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, yeah. T- uh, stuck churches have twice as many additional committees. So two times as many committees than churches that are are growing. Um, and you know, common factors that we see in those stuck churches, first of all, lack of unity which again is what a lot of this is about is creating unity within the church. Mm -hmm. Um, And then complexity as well. 
stuck churches tend to be very complex. A lot of that comes from those additional committees. And, um, and then the last thing is they just lack strong leadership. They, the power, the pastors, uh, the staff of the church, other leaders aren't empowered to lead. Um, and so kind of raising the urgency of why we can't stay where we are, why things need to change. Sometimes our governance structure was created dozens of years ago, hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And of course our culture has changed dramatically. Right. Um, and so adjusting that accordingly to help us to continue to adapt to our culture, things move quickly. Now change happens very, very fast. Um, and doing that in a way that again is informed by scripture, it, it can be incredibly helpful. So that's really where I'd begin is by considering scripture and then, um, and then raising the urgency. Um, and then we have some other resources out there for pastors. Um, our podcast, we have a couple of podcast series on governance with a lot of great information. We have a couple of webinars that we've done. Uh, you can find all of that at theunstuckgroup.com. Um, and you can use those resources as well. I would share them with your board, your current board, your current group of decision makers. Listen to them together and process that information and then determine what's the right next step for us. Yeah. Well, this is a great, great information, great conversation. Again, uh, Sean is with the Unstuck Group. We'll make sure to include some links in the show notes. Uh, let's take a quick break, Sean, and come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with Sean Bublitz. And uh, Sean, I always ask these closing questions. Everybody, you can take these as seriously or not as you'd like to. If you're Pope for a day, what is that day going to look like for you? <laughs> Yeah, I uh, so if I were pope for a day, I think I would mandate all pastors take a sabbath. That's a good one. It's you know, it's interesting we have one of the assessments that we use, uh we just call it the unstuck teams assessment and it, it measures within church teams um a kind of overall health of the team. And practicing sabbath is the lowest scoring metric out of the entire assessment consistently. Wow. Wow. Uh Pastors, church leaders are not good at practicing Sabbath. And of course, it's incredibly important. Not only is it important to rest, but I think that I have always learned more. I've been better when I step away from what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and just get away from it and see it from a different lens and come back fresh. So I actually think that practicing Sabbath, not only does it help you rest, but it helps you be better at what you do. Pastors and church leaders should be doing it. Yeah, that's good. Um, a theologian or historical Christian figure you'd want to meet or bring back to life? So um, I would love, I'd be fascinated to meet Martin Luther. Hmm. Um, more than anything, I think just how disruptive he was. Yeah. <laughs> it would just be really, really interesting. So to have a conversation with him, I think would be great. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, what do you think history will remember from our current time and place? Uh, so obviously we've been through a, a, just a huge disruption. Hopefully no, none of us live through something like this again. Right. Um, you know, I've heard uh, speculation in a lot of different areas that we're in for a decade, about 10 years of turmoil and change happening. Um I, and I've heard some people say that um, that there's too much change, too much uncertainty to know how to move forward, to make changes. So let's just kind of stay where we are. Yeah. I, th I think we might end up looking back at this season as a time when we learned how to navigate instability and uncertainty and find a way to kind of thrive through it as well. So that's really, um, I guess that's also a hope. I uh, hope we can. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about hopes for the future of Christianity then? Yeah, well, I mean, I think my hope, and we talk about this a lot with our team, is that uh, the church sees this disruption through the pandemic and everything else that's going on really just as an opportunity to refocus on the mission. Uh, I think disruptions uh, are good from time to time, and they cause us to rethink things. And so um, I hope this is a, an opportunity that we can seize to refocus on what the mission is for the church. Yeah, well, this has been a great conversation. Um Again, I'm a big believer in healthy organizations, healthy structure, and I think church governance, good church governance, can do so much to enable uh, positive ministry and encourage people. So, uh, Sean, talk about how folks can get connected with the Unstuck Group if they'd like to and learn more. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can find us at theunstuckgroup.com. Um, you can check out our podcast as well, The Unstuck Church Podcast. You can find it on any podcasting platform. And, um, you know, we have, we're have we on various social media outlets too. So uh, those are the best ways to find us. Great, great. Well, thanks again for, for the conversation. I always leave folks with a word of peace. So may God's peace be with you. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go, do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romaglevitt. Thanks, and go in peace. Thank you.